independent agency with powers to fight corruption. Economic stimulus package questioned in parliament. And joint forces college to be established. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Parliament has passed a bill to set up the Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, an independent agency that will have powers to fight the perception of corruption in the country. 92 members of Parliament present in today's sitting voted for the bill. The bill was read by the Attorney General and Deputy Prime Minister, David Stephen, and was debated on the floor of Parliament. Notable comments were made by former Prime Minister and PNC party leader Peter O'Neill and the Oro Governor. They were all in support of the ICAC bill. In voicing his support, O'Neill drew a statement released at 4 p.m. today, said independence and transparency must be the cornerstone of the legislation and implementation going forward. Since 2012, concerns on when this bill will be tabled in Parliament have been raised and it has taken almost eight years and two terms of Parliament to finally pass the bill. The establishment of the PNG ICAC will give the Commission specific powers to investigate corrupt conducts within the public sector. Similar to the functions of the Ombudsman Commission, which deals with those holding public office, and the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate that investigates criminal methods, the setting up of ICAC, according to Prime Minister James Marape, is to fight the perception of corruption in Papua New Guinea. The passing of this bill in Parliament today makes it the second bill to be passed by the Marape Stephen government. And the Speaker of Parliament, Job Pomath, has announced that a third reading will be done two months from now for a further debate. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Members of the People's National Congress or PNC party have taken seats in the opposition side after a no-show when Parliament resumed for the June sitting at 3 p.m. yesterday. The PNC members were removed from the government bench by Prime Minister James Marape, who explained in a statement that they continue to oppose his government. In today's Parliament sitting, the PNC members took seats in the opposition side after they announced their move to the opposition at 7 p.m. last night. Night. In a statement released by PNC last night, Peter O'Neill pointed out that PNC now in the opposition will work with other parliament colleagues to promote real alternative police to get the country out of the mess Marape created. Parliament began with questions without notice, standing swiftly in line to ask his series of questions directed at Treasurer Ian Lingstaki, was member for Ijivitari Richard Masere. He questioned the proposed economic stimulus package put forward by the Marapa Stephen government. It was an alternative incentive to assist businesses during the COVID-19 state of emergency by applying measures for businesses to continue to function. The concerns raised in Parliament today by Member for Ijivitari Richard Masera did not go unnoticed during the two months lockdown despite the decision of a preventative approach in mitigating the risk of importing the virus has also seemed to have a downturn effect on many businesses, especially those locally owned in the country. The Member for Ijivitari merely pointing out these facts and what the stimulus package was supposedly required for. Additionally, inquiring about the agreed 2% interest reduction rate that was highlighted in the economic stimulus package and was supposed to be exercised by commercial banks during the SOE, the approval of the release of superannuation funds for citizens whose jobs were affected, and the possibility for an income tax holiday. One of those uh, stimulus packages that was discussed uh, with the governor for Bank of PNG was to pass uh, some interest reduction rates. Uh, from the Bank of Papua New Guinea to the commercial banks and in turn the commercial banks then pass those uh, re interest reductions to their loan customers. 
And from my understanding, the, uh, the interest loan reduction that was agreed to was around 2%. But I'm, I'm, I'm informed that the commercial banks are not exercising that uh, reduction completely, but are instead passing only 1% of that in interest reduction to their loan customers. Um, can the minister, uh, the yeah, treasurer, just inform us in this house with, with uh, what's been passed from the Bank of Papua New Guinea to the commercial banks? Uh, why isn't the commercial banks passing that reduction on to customers? To which Treasurer Ian Ling Stucky responded that his department would have to look into the concerns regarding the commercial banks, further stating that the government has no oversight to determine the interest reduction rates for commercial banks and to date has received no reports. The government um, and uh, business houses had expected the commercial banks to pass on um, that 2% um, drop in interest rates. Mr. Speaker, we have asked the bank <coughs> of Papua New Guinea to, um, to assist the government uh, to continue negotiating with commercial banks since the government has no oversight to determine interest rates for commercial banks. Um, at this stage, Mr. Speaker, I haven't received um, a report yet on what exactly the banks have passed on and to whom, and when I receive that, Mr. Speaker, I'm more than happy to table that as part of a statement. Ling Staki went on to state that a tax holiday would affect the country's revenue position and that it would only be looked at closely to be used as a last resort to assist businesses. To touch income taxes, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, is something that's, that's going to affect our revenue position and it's something that we would um, uh, look at very, very closely and, and, and uh, use or, or, or reduce as a very last resort. At this point in time, there is no intention by um, the Government of Treasury to touch that particular base. Advising the floor that a detailed report outlining the concerns raised by the member for Ijivitari today would be presented and tabled in tomorrow's Parliament session. Anit Kora, National MTV News. The construction of five major road links to connect provinces by road in the country have been announced by Works Minister Michael Nali in Parliament today. This announcement was in response to a supplementary question raised by Western Governor Taboy Awiyoto regarding roads in Western Province. In Parliament today, a larger amount of time during questions without notice was spent on discussions involving the construction of roads under the responsibility of the national and provincial governments. The first question, raised by Gulf Governor Chris Iveta, was asked to the National Planning Minister, Sam Basil, to specify how the 40 million kina allocated to connect Moroban Eastern Highlands provinces to Gulf and into Port Mosby have been spent and when actual work can begin. So asking Blomio SMM number one, money stop or money not stop? So starting work this year. This proposed road link will start from 10 mile in Lay to Bulolo district and into Gulf province. Planning Minister and Member for Bulolo Sam Basil responded saying 5 million of the total 40 million kina have been given to the Works Department to commence work. Uh, Mr. Speaker, out of 40 million and 1 plus 5 million, um, Planning Department is Salim Peninsula Department of Works. Now, I think behind Minister yet can talk to me behind and by bringing him to the cabinet, uh, 1 plus paper, lo me plus looks away. Now, cabinet by endorse him. In a separate question without notice raised by Western Governor Tabo Awiyoto, concerns on when the Daru to Mohead Road would be completed, giving people in Western Province road access to basic government services. This is the road I'm carrying for people from the place. For the last 45 years, I must have backside through the province. 
The works minister, while responding to Governor Awiyoto's questions, was interrupted by Tambul Nebilia MP through a supplementary question on concerns of funding in Western Highlands, which a 1.2 million kina was allocated to the works department, but no work was done on the Kata Road to link Tambul Nebilia and Hagen Central districts. Mr. Lingam goes along Western Island, Central goes along uh, Lower Nabila, which is my area. Uh, to, after two years, me put the money on Kuta Road, that's eight kilometers. Now, after two years, all of been completing this road. Honorable member. In response to all these concerns, the works minister highlighted the government's intention to build five major roads in Papua New Guinea, linking up more provinces through road networks. The first one will be the one from nine miles ago long, Waubulolo, Kamlo, Malalawa. That will be the first one. The other very important connect PNG is the east to West Sipik, starting from Water Rice, Igolo Bogia, Naigolo Angoram, Naigo. Nadla is the east to West New Britain. Nadla is the Bougainville, Manus. Inside the Morobe, I have a contract finish, Lord Bright Labour connect him, all get a Taiwan CSE go, all get a long Kaboom, come go, all get a long Morobe. That contract has already been awarded. That is part of the Connect PNG. Also, the Islands Highway, by the previous government and this government, fixing up the Islands Highway from Ley, going up to Mount Hagen, and then connecting to Pogera, connecting to Kobiago, connecting to Como, over into Telefomin. That's Connect PNG. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. The country has a new National Education Board, or NEB, through the Office of the Education Minister Joseph Yopi Yopi, 28 new board members were appointed. The board members took their oaths recently during a ceremony on Loloata Island outside Port Moresby. NEB is the highest decision-making body and is responsible for the overseeing and functioning of the national education system through the National Education Plan. The new board members will serve a term of three years. You brought to the table, as I said, vast experience, vast knowledge uh, from all sectors and uh, all, all sectors, partners, churches, and business houses, NGOs, women, union, universities, Department of Higher Education, Provincial uh, Education Division, and the Education Department. The kind of policies that we make through, with our minister will determine the future of this country. We're not here to get our allowances and stipends and so on. We as members are taking up and swearing and taking off now to take up a very noble membership on a board. We're not here for money, we're not here for pri privileges, but take up a very noble uh, position of responsibility. The National Executive Council has approved for a new establishment of a joint forces college. Deputy Prime Minister and Attorney General David Stephen announced this recently. Stephen described this as a bold step to enable security forces work cohesively while building their capacity as state institutions. Heads of the disciplinary forces were also present during the announcement. The Deputy Prime Minister says this is no ordinary plan but relates to 2013 security policies. Stephen says police, CSN, PNG Defence Force have to work cohesively to improve and advance national security, a policy that needs financing and capacity building. Joint Forces College that intends to bring together training uh, of our next generation of uh, uh, officers for the discipline forces. Work initially began in 2013, however, paperwork was slow. CS Commissioner Stefan Pogani says training happened occasionally because of financial support. He wants better support to fund the new Joint Forces College going forward. It becomes more independent uh, and we run the college as um, sort of a technically it should be one of the higher learning institutions in the country. That um, the courses that they should be offered at college 
uh, should have the same national qualification framework, just like our colleges and the, um, uh, the university. While details of the new college remain skeptical, the government aims to see the different forces work alongside each other under special circumstances. With NEC giving a nod for the building of this institution, funding and policy framework is crucial. It's a foundation work that must be done. A lot of this work is already occurring, but the, with the legal framework or the policy framework in certain instances need to be put together so we formalize them. Both the police and CS minister agreed and say relevant support must be given so officers in the three different security forces are trained highly and build capacity within the command. So I think it's uh, these such initiatives at colleges where they are going together, respect, work together, train together. I think that's the way forward uh, since this is the change of technology. Jack Lepava, Jr. National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Three aid posts in Sumkar District, Medang, have reported an increase of flu-like symptoms among patients. Deputy Director of Public Health in Medang, Karoy Kamak, says they also received reports of four deaths while three medical officers needed to be airlifted to Medang Hospital. Kamak says three teams comprising six members were airlifted to the aid posts. The teams are there to carry out investigations and collect test samplings. The three aid posts in Kumbu, Inion, and Apasaku villages in Sumkar are only accessible by foot or by air. A week ago, three teams were sent to carry out investigations to establish why there is an increase of the flu-like symptoms. Uh, because of the geography and uh, uh, the spread of the disease, it reaches uh, Inion. And also it went as far as uh, Apasakul. Apasakul is also one of our eight posts, which is unmanned. So the, the community health worker at Kumbu alerted us that he had an increased number of flu-like syndrome. So since we are in COVID-19, we have to uh, attend and we send a rapid response team, plus our surveillance team also went to uh, these three locations to investigate and come and tell us what actually is happening. The rapid response and surveillance team also collected samples to test for COVID-19. According to the Deputy Director of Public Health, they were here to confirm if the signs in most of the patients occurred a month or a year ago. But because of the information was not available or did not reach us until after uh, three, four weeks ago, we re received a report from Kumbu 8 Post and also the uh, officer in charge of uh, Bunabun Health Center. The sampling only covers those who went to the respective ad post with severe acute respiratory infections. The rapid response team, however, was not able to airlift the three medical officers who needed medivac to Medang Hospital. For now, medical officers on the ground are treating patients symptomatically. We are giving symptomatic treatment. Those guys coming with a, a flu-like uh, uh, illness, we're telling them that uh, do the home remedy. And then those with the shortness of bread or this, we tell them to give them amoxicillin and little, just symptomatic treatment that we normally give to our normal patients. Most samples were sent to the three ed posts yesterday to allow medical officers to collect samples. Martha Lewis, National MTV News, Medang. A house in Leh, formerly used as a branch for family planning organization Mari Stopes, was destroyed in a fire this afternoon. Firefighters arrived soon after the blaze began and contained the fire which destroyed much of the building. It is understood the fire started from the kitchen area. Two occupants in the house left soon after the fire began. Come, help him, sir. Fire, two plus, please, sir. 
Police have begun investigating death threats against the chief executive of the Lay City Authority. The threats sent by SMS were aimed at Neil Ellery and his family. While Mr Ellery has not given details as to why the threats were issued, he says the work done by the authority to clamp down on illegal spending and wastage could have trigger, triggered this recent threat. The chief executive of the Lay City Authority, Neil Ellery, held a brief news conference this afternoon after threats were issued to him and his family. I think the, uh, the people who have sent it have mistaken me for a foreigner and they think that they will scare me and I'll run. The short messages which we can't show due to the obscenities contained in it said he would be shot and that they knew where he lived. But Neil Ellery said this afternoon he's not afraid and the threats mean that the Lay City Authority is doing a good job so far. I am doing my job. If these sorts of threats are coming through, it means I'm doing my job. It means I'm getting, I'm affecting the corrupt Kaiko Man right at the core now. We have closed off every angle that they can steal, possibly steal money or anything from the council. And we're making sure that the, uh, the services will be delivered back into the city. So, even though I know who you are, I need some evidence. Since taking office as the CEO, the authority has fought an uphill battle to reduce costs and improve municipal services. It's also worked hard to generate its own revenue. And since 2017, there's been a lot of resistance. And while that may not be directly related to this recent threat, Ellery has made no secret of the fact that LCA staff have also been personally threatened. A complaint has been laid. Lay's Metropolitan Superintendent says the phones from where the threats came will be tracked and the owners arrested. Scott Whitey, National MTV News, Lay. The Independent Consumer and Competition Commission is in the process of amending the Price Regulation Act to increase the penalty fine. Commissioner Paulus Ein, in a radio interview on Monday, said the current fine of 600 kina is a fair price to pay as a penalty fee. Mr. Ein was in lay for the nationwide price monitoring exercise during the SOE period. The ICCC was given the authority to monitor price during the SOE period under the National Emergency Order No. 19. ICCC Commissioner Paulus Ein said Order 19 has given the Commission more powers to operate effectively outside of the ICCC Price Regulation Act. The Price Regulation Act orders a penalty fee of 600 kina, whereas Order 19 issues a hefty fine of 5,000 kina for one infringement notice. Blow surkim this blow walk me black and surkim. Me black and walk him me go aggressively bring this guy or set house him this blow man lost to her. Carry me call a station. Tasolo fine, tasol na kamna. And taking slow now we have a trauma and a guy is free tomorrow. So this play him some up some play here where me yet me look look long. Walk one time old minister. He not long all can. Send him this uh, price regulation check law, giving people more power. <laughs> the increase in demand for goods during the SOE period created a window of opportunity for price increase in many retail outlets. ICCC was given the power under Order 19 to penalize shop owners who increased prices beyond the 5% mark. Order 19 also stated that wholesalers and retailers were to get approval before any price increase. But as the SOE period winds down, so does the powers of ICCC under Order 19. Going Given the effect that Order 19 has had, ICCC is looking to make amendments to its Price Regulation Act to be as effective. Charlene Airy, National MTV News, Lay. The Zufomo clan of Babuaf in the Huan Gulf district of Morbe was the first clan to come forward to the media with their registered ILG certificate as the principal landowners of Mugosu land that hosts the Wafi mine project. According to the chief and chairman of Zufomo, 
Gyu Ziriruk. It took the clan almost 16 years to get their ILG certificate as landowners of Mugosu land. The land consists of almost 11,000 hectares that accommodates the proposed Wafi mine project of Morbe. Since the announcement of the Wafi mine project in the UN Gulf district of Morobe, there have been a lot of landowners' issues associated with the mine. In 2007, a legislation was passed establishing a new procedure which incorporated land groups can voluntarily register the title to their customary land, releasing it for development. The Zufomu clan of Babuaf in the UN Gulf district of Morobe now has legal rights over Mugosu land that hosts the Wafi mine project. Tok Sawero you government na company osem no can entertain him so correno nas. Miki sim ayet ziblo mi penis. Government na company you must still want him me. Miki sim ayet zi penis ro giran blo mi. Giran blo mi em Mugusto. Ona si blo mi em Mugusto. Dear one to me, make it seem I had three blow me penis. According to Zufomu ILG chairman Giu Ziriru, the clan owns about 11,000 hectares of land areas of the proposed Wafi mine project. Zufomu clan is part of the Wafi's tribe under the Babuaf community of Wampar LLG in the UN Gulf District, Morobe. The chairman said the clan members registered the Zufomu ILG. The ILG certificate was issued to them almost three weeks ago. We walk ro this ra ayet ziblo mi em uh, 16 years now mi kisim ayet ziro giran blo mi ro mugusto chairman giu called on the morbe provincial government and administration and un gulf district and other stakeholders to work together with zufomu clan on issues associated with the wafi mine as the legal landowners zufomu ilg has in place a technical team consisting of professionals to support the land group to form more I'm coming up. They are regularly one now, let us now. How about provincial government come at them all? Because we are uh, spending money in a supporting all narrow group way or stop outside the project site. It's a very bad uh, set scenario. So it's it's up to provincial government uh, or district that all must start to identify more true learners lots kind project in the coming future. So what we now? What we now I'm to form I'm confirmed now. So when I'm standing provincial government now, please or but need or lose him now come on them to form now. So all come to form or come to me now. I was given a mandate two weeks ago. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Port Moresby Nature Park received a grant of 175,000 kina from the United Nations Development Programme in partnership with the national government. Park General Manager Michelle McGeorge says the grant will support the park to extend a range of conserv conservation and education initiatives. Papua New Guinea's only internationally recognized wildlife park received a massive boost to its conservation and education initiatives. Hosting over 130,000 visitors each year, the park offers the general public an opportunity to experience firsthand the country's unique biodiversity. With COVID-19 affecting most of the park's operations, Park General Manager Michelle McGeorge says the grant will help them do more. That's really um, impacted the nature park. We are a charity, so we rely on the visitation from the community to help us with our works, as well as the business community through sponsorship and NCDC. So we're really um, happy today to be able to work closely and, and again with UNDP to be able to support the park. This is the second time the park has received such support provided under the larger Global Environment Fund conservation projects aimed to protect critically endangered species. The park continues to play an important role in raising public awareness to the government's efforts in expanding the National Protected Area Network with UNDP as lead support partner. We have been trying to not only expanding the network but also trying to put um, the network of protected areas on a sustainable financial footing and we've also tried to use this network of protected areas so it can provide sustainable livelihoods for people because at the end of the day you know people have to derive um, also um, a living. 
Although the park has remained open to guests during the COVID-19 SOE, they look forward to welcoming more guests when the SOE is lifted. Lillian Soperakinea, National MTV News. All Search Limited says it will challenge a decision by the Securities Commission that disallows the company from raising new capital. All Search says it complied with all legal procedures and will vigorously defend its position. The Securities Commissioner said earlier the company did not comply with legal procedures and failed to get approval from the Commission. The Commission then issued a suspension of trading on the PNG Stock Exchange as of yesterday. And now looking at the Nasfund market reports, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.289 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2815 US dollars, 0.4049 Australian dollars, 0.2442 Euro and 29.95 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee and cocoa closed lower, copper closed higher. Palm oil closed lower, crude oil is trading higher and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 267.63 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 102.41 points higher and the All Ordinaries is trading at 101.24 points higher. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with stories making headlines overseas. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, less violence but more anger on the streets of America tonight. Curfews broken again in an outpouring fury over the death of a black man in police custody. The mother of George Floyd's child voiced her grief in front of thousands who turned up demanding an end to police brutality. Meanwhile, thousands of armed troops are now being deployed across the United States amidst this crisis. America's hurting. This is what those officers took. And for days, America's been angry. This is the new America, troops on the streets. Now, more than 20,000 National Guard soldiers activated in more than two dozen states. A peaceful show of force on Washington's Lincoln Memorial. And in Tennessee, they lay their shields down in a symbolic act. But it's not enough for some. When you bring in people not trained for the circumstance, but still with loaded weapons and put under horrible stress, really bad things happen. Tonight, his city's bracing for further upheaval after stores were ransacked in late night looting. There's now a new earlier curfew, 8 p.m. Oh. And today, police swooped in. Both sides are suffering. In Las Vegas, a police officer was shot and critically wounded, and four were shot in Missouri. <laughs> Can we make some sense out of this? Senselessness, too, in Buffalo, New York. A woman's been charged after three officers survived being rammed into. Boots may have been put on the ground. But in their thousands, people are still putting their feet on the streets. In George Floyd's home city of Houston today, and in just the last hour, more unrest in Portland, Oregon. The president held up the Bible at St. John's Church yesterday. I just wish he opened it once in a while. Today, it was the national shrine of St. John Paul II. They stood in silence. It was anything but as the motorcade sped through Washington. And no silence either back at the president's doorstep. Defiance of the seven o'clock curfew in the capital. Amid all the noise is a six-year-old girl without a father. He will never walk down the aisle. This is a nation in damage control and into its second week of unrest. And there's no easy fix. A warning, there are distressing images in this next report. 
The death of George Floyd in police custody was just a spark that lit the flames of several other unrest. Protesters say for black people in America, police brutality is an everyday reality. This is the kind of violent encounter fueling protests across America. Police body cam video captures Atlanta officers using tasers, confronting two black college students just a few days ago. The pair say they were getting something to eat when they got stuck in a traffic jam during protests. From then it was just utter chaos. Police using a stun gun to drag them out of the car. I actually thought both me and Messiah were going to die. Six police officers involved are now facing charges. There have to be fundamental changes with policing. For a week now, those protesting against the police brutality involved in George Floyd's death have all been saying the same thing. This is years and generations and decades and centuries of compounded racism. According to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, African Americans are almost three times more likely to be shot dead by police than white Americans. Historians point to the progression from slavery through to the segregation and lynchings of last century. Blacks have been disproportionately targeted by police. It sparked the Watts riots in 1965, LA's streets again on fire in the 90s, after police officers involved in this savage beating of Rodney King were acquitted. We have an injustice in the criminal justice system that is abhorrent. The Black Lives Matter movement was born out of the fatal police shooting of black teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri six years ago. And just months ago, police shot dead paramedic Breonna Taylor in Kentucky while executing a search warrant. We are all here because law enforcement refused to do what they were trained to do, what humanity dictates that they do. Put it down, put it down. A plea tonight to take the target off their backs. This just needs to cease. And Chukar Sports is next. Elijah Lavetta has the details from the sports desk. Thank you, Helen. An update on PNG High Performance. Presidents of affiliated leagues addressed Ghost Leagues and Super Rugby. That's in Chukar Sports after the break. Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. PNG High Performance is planning to set up an entry point as access to all its sporting facilities in the country. This is part of its COVID-19 protocol moving forward. This was discussed during the PNG Sports Foundation Board's first quarter meeting held over the, meet held over the weekend. Pardon me. PNG Sports Foundation's efforts to manage and maintain its sporting facilities in the country to adhere to the back to normal COVID-19 protocols. The foundation is now planning to implement the one entry point strategy where all venue users will be issued access passes to enter into all the venues. This is part of PNG SF's initiative to capture the data of venue users and managed responsibility for social tracing in the event of an outbreak. Further preventative measures for spectators will be carefully managed by federations or associations as part of the COVID-19 protocol, particularly where there is a competition or training for sporting teams or individuals. In order to address spectator experience, PNG Sports Foundation will be trialing out its broadcast license to live stream domestic events within the next six months. Presidents of affiliated leagues and the PNG RFL gathered at the National Football Stadium today to demand answers regarding the 2020 annual general meeting. President for Port Mosby South Rugby Football League, Brown Murama, says PNG RFL needs to come clear and inform the rugby league community of its plans. 
With only three days remaining, to this is AGM, concerned presidents of affiliated clubs, today gathered to see CEO of PNG RFL, Rea Taurau, to seek answers following information on ghost affiliated clubs. Mosby South RFL president Brown Murema says from the 32 affiliated clubs under PNG RFL, there are 20 non affiliated clubs expected to also vote at this year's AGM for the chairman position. The 32 leagues, the eligible come to a process of vetting by the directors, and now the other 20 added on the, the list that, 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 that that, that, that has to be carried out by the PNZ of CEO using what criteria and what process to uh, get those uh, uh, 20 uh, ghost leaks, I would say. When asked how he got the information regarding the non-affiliated clubs, he said... As a stakeholder to this office, and it's a public office where all the members of the presidents of rugby league in the country to access to the office to the information. However, he can't allow me to access this information. But this is uh, what uh, uh, the current board is and those another 20 leagues to attend the AGM. President of Siopossa Rugby Football League, Joe Wakiva, says PNG RFL needs to come clear. Why, why don't they make it transparent? And why don't uh, uh, the CEO and the, the chairman and the South, Southern Confederate uh, director, for three of them to come out clear and explain to us with the 32 registered league uh, this year to go for the AGM. Why is it that the 20 coming in at a very short period of time? Is this trying to, is he trying to get the number to uh, go into election and become the chairman or what? He says with only three days to the AGM, there are no updates as to what will transpire on June the 6th, which is the date of the AGM. We are registered, we are qualified, we have been playing uh, champion games, and we know that we are with the, with the Confederate. Can those 20 teams that is bringing in, can they also show us, can they tell us, are they, are they qualified? Are they qualified to come in for the meeting? This is my question to the chairman and to the director and the CEO. Godwin Eki, Trukai Sports. And we'll have more sporting updates after the break. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. The resumption of Super Rugby will see Golden Point extra time coming into effect. No more draws and fury and also attempts to speed up the game. Since 1974, American football has had overtime. Did he break the play? Yes, touchdown! And the Patriots have won the Super Bowl! And for almost 20 years, the NRLs had golden points. He hits it! He's got it! He's got the field goal! And now New Zealand rugby is finally following suit. Nothing's bad about a draw. There's a lot of history uh, in rugby wrapped in draws, but uh, Super Rugby out here row is an opportunity to try something new. Something new or something borrowed, with league fans no strangers to the concept. Yeah, well, they, they, can, they can gloat. A league fan himself, Highlanders playmaker Josh Ioane welcoming the change. Creates some excitement around the game. Last week we saw, saw the Panthers go to Golden Point, you know, it was quite exciting. So, yeah, no, I'm a big fan of it and, yeah, should be good. Attack coach Tony Brown just glad to see New Zealand rugby taking the opportunity. I think the game always needs changes. Rugby's moving so fast and it only, um, only makes sense that the rules move with it. The trial period also backing referees to enforce stricter breakdown rules to speed up the game and police the offside line more to encourage attacking play. These are teams we love to attack and we um, want to throw the ball around so hopefully that's what it creates. And throw in a new red card system that would see an offending player replaced by a substitute after 20 minutes. 15 v 15 for 60 minutes is better than um, 15 v 14 for 80. The initial reaction from fans on social media has been divided, but Lendrum says their feedback will play an important role at the end of the trial period. Clearly how the fans respond if we get those moments that I talked about um, will, be, will be pivotal. A trial for now, but perhaps a glimpse of what long-term changes lie in store. 
You're watching National MTV News. Helen will bring you the weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. True Kai Sport. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight in the southern region. Cloudy with occasional rain showers in Port Moresby. Partly cloudy with chance of morning rain showers in Daru. Occasional rain showers in Kerama. Partly cloudy with a few morning showers and drizzles in Alatau. And cloudy with morning showers in Popandita. In the Mombasa region, a few rain showers then fine. Cloudy morning in Lee. Cloudy with few rain showers in Medang and Wiwak. A few showers then fine morning in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine, although partly cloudy in Larangau. A shower or two, then fine morning in Kavian, Kokopora, Bala and Puka. Fine, although partly cloudy with a shower or two in Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, rain showers and drizzles, then morning fog right across the region in Mount Hagen, Guroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for Wednesday, 3rd of June 2020. Pleasant viewing. Bye for now.